But today, um, we're very pleased to have three people who are happy to present about Google Earth, which is going to be one of the main things I think that people will be using this summer. And I will let them introduce themselves, except for Steve Whitmire, who will start it off. Thanks, John and Ann and Chris and Kurt and all the other folks that have pulled all of this stuff together at very short order. It's really impressive. Um, the leadership um, in this NAGT group, as well as just the community as a whole coming together. Uh, what we want to talk uh, a bit about today are Google Earth resources that are that may be relevant for people as they're grappling with virtual field courses this summer. Uh, there's been a whole lot of stuff done, obviously, using the Google Earth platform over the years. We can only scratch the surface of that. We've tried to tailor it a little bit towards these virtual field course needs. Um, and there's three of us that are going to sort of share um, this presentation today. But I, I do want to highlight that there's all sorts of other people out there that have done a lot of work in this, in this realm. So this is certainly not an end all be all. Um, the other thing I, I will mention is we've had several really good presentations on other sorts of digital tools, field tools, mapping tools, et cetera. And I just want to say this is just one element in your toolbox. Um, you know, I mean, there's lots of other reasons to choose things like Strabo Spot or Gigapans or, or GIS or, um, you know, virtual field experiences, immersive experiences. You know, you got to choose what's best for you. And so we're just going to show some things that you might want to think about, uh, might want to make use of. So. Uh, my co-presenters today um, are Barb Tewksbury and John Bailey, and I'll hand off to them in just a second. I also want to highlight a couple of other people that couldn't be with us today, but also contributed some material. Uh, Tom Blankenshoff, who's done a bunch of really good things um, with using uh, programs like S2K and P2K to build models in Google Earth to represent structure and paleomag information. Mladen Djordjevic, who's with IRIS, uh, but he helped uh, design the last thing we're going to show today, which is a, a, a tool to help um, load and position uh, outcrop data within uh, the web-based Google Earth. Um, having said that, let me hand off uh, to Barb Tewksbury so she can sort of introduce herself. Oh, yeah, I should introduce myself. I'm a professor at James Madison University. I also at the moment wear a second hat as an NSF program director. Uh, but I will not be talking in my NSF capacity today. I will be talking in my um, JMU capacity. So, um, okay, Barb. I'm Barb Tewksbury. I'm professor of uh, geosciences at Hamilton College. I'm a structural geologist. I've used Google Earth in almost all of my courses, and I also use it extensively in the research that I do in Egypt. John? Hey all, I'm John Bailey. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I spent uh, over five years as a program manager on the Google Earth team working on education stuff. Um, that was up until last summer when I decided I wanted to get off the, the corporate wheel and take a six month work sabbatical, which has turned out to be about the worst timing possible. Um, so that sabbatical is going on a little longer than I'd uh, originally planned. Um, but hopefully at some point, and I'm going to get back to some sort of earth science education position. So if you're hiring, feel free to get in touch. Um, uh, but and I'm very possibly that we back in academia because prior to Google, I was a researcher and professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, which is how I met Steve um, back in the early days of the sort of wild west of Google Earth when it first came out. Uh, I, I met Declan Dupois, who I'm sure many of you knew, um, also some folks like Ron Scott and uh, Rich Treves. And through them, I met Steve and we started collaborating on stuff together. Um, so when Steve contacted me about the seminar, I thought it would be really fun to, to work together again. Um, so like Steve's not speaking from his JMU uh, stance and not, not from um, NSF. I likewise, because I, I don't work there anymore, I'm not speaking and a Google promotional standpoint here, um, but as an experienced user who has maybe a broader under understanding of the application the most. Which kind of brings me to my starting point, and I guess uh, I should probably switch to screen sharing, Steve. Uh, 
So. Okay, we can see it. All right, great. So where I want to start today, um, I think is, is, is kind of an important point. It, it might seem very simple and you might think you know what this is all about, but when I ask people to explain, they don't always know necessarily the differences between the versions of Google Earth that are now available. So Google Earth has evolved over the years. I, 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 I'm not going to dive into the history too much, but basically it came from a 2001 startup company called Keyhole, bought by Google in 2004, released as Google Earth version three. There was never a Google Earth version one or two, kind of a bit of trivia for you there, um, in 2005. And that was as this downloadable, executable file that you, you had to install on your PC or your Mac. Um, and there were many versions of that. There was Plus, there was Pro, there was Free, there was Enterprise. Um, over the years, those have all evolved. And now there just remains one of those versions. It was what was formerly Google Earth Pro. It's now completely free. It's still available, downloadable for a PC or a Mac. Um, it's always had some issues, and we're going to get into some of that um, and explain why we're not going to focus on some of the features in that version because of those issues. But one of the main issues really with, with the desktop version is that it was always resource intensive. It required a lot of bandwidth. You know, you had to install it so it didn't work on things like Chromeboxes. So a few years ago, Google decided to re-engineer. Bear in mind, by this stage, the original code behind that was over 10 years old. In fact, if, if, if really it was nearer 15 years old. So in, in code years, that's like you know, 150 years old. It's kind of like dog years. You have to multiply it. So it's amazing that it even still works, quite frankly. Um, but it wasn't meeting the, the needs of especially the education community. So Google re-engineered from the ground up a version of Google uh, that works in web browsers. Uh, originally it was just Chrome, but it now works on Firefox, Edge, Pro. does not work in Safari or Internet Explorer, um, probably never will. Um, but along with that, they also redid the mobile app. Now the mobile app for Google Earth was always very limited. Um, but now there's a much better version of it um, that is effectively the same as the web version. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that here time. But for whatever version we're talking about, the, the, you can really break it down into three fundamental elements of what goes on in this application. And that is the fact that there's a 3D model that has features features that allow you to manipulate, uh, manipulate the model and then to access content of different types. Um, you can learn more about this at the, the URL up there, f.google.com, but just to mention a few things about this, the 3D model, when I say that, I'm talking about the, the underlying DEM, the digital elevation model, over which is draped the satellite and aerial data. Um, and also combined with that is you have the 360 street view imagery that you can access globally. When we talk about manipulating the model, we mean things like navigating or using tools in, built in there like the measuring tool. And we're gonna to show a few of these things today. And then content, by content, we mean the ability to view, create, import, um, or export either already supplied data, internal um, content, um, for example, GIS layers in there, or third-party created content and information. And in particular, some of you may, in relation to this, some of, may, of you have heard that, some of you may have heard, sorry, it's, I'm in Australia right now, it's one in the morning here, so I'm gonna try and stay awake. Uh, you may have heard the term KML, stands for Keyhole Markup Language. 
if you've wondered what KML is, it's, it's a form of extensible markup language, um, very similar to HTML. In fact, the way you can think about it is HTML makes web pages, KML makes stuff in Google Earth. If you've ever looked at HTML, you could look at the KML code and it would make perfect sense to you. Um, however, the great thing about Google Earth has always been you don't actually need to see the code to make KML. If you've ever made a place mark or a line or anything in Google Earth through all those clickable menus, you have written or, or made KML because that's the code behind it. Uh, you might also have heard KMZ and people are, well, what's the difference? KMZ, KML. KMZ is just a zipped version of KML. Why would you zip it? Um, well, if you want to compress the file size um, and or if you have images that need to go into that code, that's when KMZ gets used. So let's talk about the desktop version. Um, we are going to talk about it today. We are going to show some examples, um, but we're not going to dive down, down into the sort of the usability and, and the features in there. Um, why not? Well, a couple of main reasons. Um, one is it's just not reliable anymore. As I explained, it's, it's very old, it's still around, and it still has a lot of function, especially in the area we're talking about today, kind of uh, geology, field geology on a desktop, on a, on a computer. Um, but, you know, I don't necessarily recommend you basing everything on it just because I wouldn't guarantee that things are going to carry on working like tomorrow, next week, the next month. Um, also, if we start getting into showing some of the things you can do in desktop, it gets a little confusing because a lot of that functionality isn't available in the web version. All of that said, there is some great content on the desktop version that can only be accessed through the desktop version. And so we're, we're going to start by showing some of these examples and I'm going to hand back over to Steve to do this. While the transition's going on, if you want to ask questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Steve, Steve, you're muted still. Okay. So hopefully you can all see my screen again. Um, what I'm going to do here then is just touch on a few uh, places where there are there's some information and some resources that are out there that are available. Um, let's start with some of the NAGT resources. So for example, um, let me pull this up here really quickly. Um, there we go. Okay, so this was a, uh, an NAGT page that was put together by Glenn Richard quite a few years ago. It's got some basics about using Google Earth in the classroom, and this is all targeted at desktop Earth. Uh, but there's a lot of really good resources here. Keep in mind, this was done several years ago, so there probably are some legacy issues involved, but lots of good links on this page. Um, again, you can. This is teaching with Google Earth on on the CERC page. Um, some other things that are also available uh, through this NAGT platform are. Um, John had mentioned that uh, we all got involved a while ago working with Google Earth, and this led to a project called Geode that Declan Depuer was the the lead PI on that. I was a co PI, as as was Callan Bentley. Several other people, uh, such as Barb and, and Chris and St. John and some others, have been involved in this project. Uh, there originally was a web page dedicated to that. That no longer exists, but uh, Chris and St. John and some people at, at NAGT, Sean Fox and some others, uh, did a, a lot of good work uh, last year and the year before in porting a bunch of these materials over to a page on the Teach the Earth site. Um, this is uh, as you can see up there, the URL geode um, index at the Teach the Earth site. And there are several different types of resources here. Um, most of these, in fact, I think all of these require desktop Earth. Uh, but Kristen has 
some great things in terms of exploring marine sediments and um, some exercises that you might want to do with that. Um, virtual marine sediment core, these have models where you can actually pull up sediment cores out of what looks like you're pulling them out of the ocean floor. Um, and one other thing that I will highlight here, which is this Pangea breakup exercise, um, which is where we built a, uh, a basically uh, an animation in Google Earth with some bells and whistles showing um, sort of Pangea through time. And I've been using that in an introductory class as sort of a, a, an exercise that students can drive themselves and explore based on um, a lot of the original data sets uh, that came around um, seafloor spreading and, and, uh, and plate tectonics and things like that. So there are resources here. Um, there, so that's this geode site. There's also a parallel site that's on my website now that has a lot of those same resources. Um, and that's, you can reach this from the NAGT site or you can reach this from my site. Again, the, the link is up there. You'll notice a lot of these are the same. A couple of other things that have been added. Uh, Maladin Georgievich and I a few years ago wrote a, a, a script to move uh, elements around the Google Earth globe because Google Earth doesn't allow you to move things in mass if you want. Um, so we wrote that and that's kind of how we built the Pangea breakup application. That runs out of Google Maps so that that'll work in your web browser. And then a couple of these down at the bottom I'm going to get out later today. These are some uh, web browser based resources for Google Earth that are sort of in development, uh, but they may be useful to people as we do, uh, as we work towards virtual field experiences. Um, let me just demo now a couple of these uh, desktop versions of resources. So here is one, this is the Pangea breakup exercise. You have to download the master KML and then you load it in your desktop version, version of Google Earth. But it, you know, it's the usual rotatable globe, but then it's got a time slider up at the top that allows you to go back in time um, to when Pangea was together. Um, you'll notice it's got a counter up at the upper right that shows you in 10 million year increments where you are. Um, there's a lot of things out there that do the same sort of thing. I'm not saying that this is the one you have to use, uh, but you'll notice over on the left under the features, you can turn on lots of different types of features and these are data sets. So for example, I've turned on mountain belts. And if you zoom in, you get the titles, you know, for the mountain belts. But the other things that are kind of cool, um, you can turn various ones of those on and off, but you can also run tours that are centered in different locations. So for example, you know, maybe we're used to seeing this from the perspective of North America, but maybe you'd rather see it from the perspective of the Southern Ocean, right? And so this is basically just running it in time showing you uh, a different focus on the, on the breakup. The other thing that's kind of neat that you can do is you can view this from a different sort of perspective. So let's say you really want to see what happens re relative to Africa. And for that, you can center it on Africa. It'll keep Africa fixed and it'll move everything else, right? Or you can keep North America fixed and see how everything else moves relative to that. And again, you can turn on and off various sorts of data sets. So I'll leave it at that. Um, unfortunately, this uses a bunch of things that the web-based version does not use, like time sliders, um, like things called network links that bring in other files from other places. So this is part of the functionality that unfortunately the web version does not have right now. Um, the other thing is Tom Blenkinsop has written some very useful tools, again, using the, the web-based version, uh, S2K and P2K. There are a couple links here and you guys will have access to this later if you wanna get a hold of these, these, um, this type of information. But what these things are, are uh, they basically are, are models that represent structural data. And again, because they're models, you can't use it in the browser-based version but they're pretty cool. Um, so this is the, a, a view of the structure one and these are the various models showing planes that intersect and showing lines and how they can be represented, shown on a stereo net and a screen overlay with a key up at the top. 
Um, this is the Paleo Mag one. There's some different versions uh, of this, but again, this is showing you rotations and as uh, symbols and so forth. Uh, all of this, both of these two things run out of Excel macros. So you can download the Excel to put your own data in and then generate the KML file that will then show these images. Um, so something kind of cool to look at. I think I've got it on here. Let me just take a look here. Yeah, so I'll turn off Pangea and um, I'll turn on Tom's model. Maybe, there we go. Just to kind of show you what these things look like. Right, and so here it is. Of course, because they're models, you can rotate them, you can look at them in all sorts of, sorts of different views. And using his macro, um, you can generate these things. So um, pretty cool. And uh, again, if, if you wanna know more about that, the person to talk to is Tom. Tom Blankensop. Okay, um, enough about um, my uh, examples. Let's hand this over to Barb, and Barb can sort of show you some things that are perhaps more relevant to actual uh, field types of mapping exercises and field data collection. So I'm going to stop sharing so that Barb can start. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to uh, do a little bit with Google Earth desktop, although much of what I'm going to show can actually be done in uh, the web-based version. But we're here in Morocco, and for those of us who are geologists, we look at the patterns here, and we see some things that are absolutely critical to interpreting what we think is going on in terms of the geology. But when our students look at these kinds of um, images, um, many of them don't see anything but the patterns. They don't see any meaning in the patterns. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a short example of how you can use Google Earth to help students visualize what is, what is uh, generating these patterns and help them develop a, a better sense of what a geologic map and a geologic cross-section looks like. One of the, uh, of course, the really critical things about Google Earth is the ability for students to fly in, um, tilt, and uh, explore an area in three dimensions. And although this isn't exactly like being in the field, there are places in the world where it really is almost the next best thing, where you can see fabulously exposed dip surfaces and see that the patterns that they're looking at in the imagery are eroded dipping layers in this particular in this particular case. So it's not a perfect substitute for being in the field, but for students who have not been in the field much, particularly ones who have not had structural geology, this is a, a real um, Im important substitute for the kinds of things that you might take them out into the field where they can actually get a sense that we're looking at three-dimensional layers of rocks. The other thing that students can do is, is um, look for mappable units. So the combination of colors in Google Earth plus uh, differences in resistance allows students to define mappable units, contacts between them, and then um, draw the outcrop traces of those contacts to uh, develop a geologic map. And of course, this isn't complete. I've just drawn a few contacts on here and their outcrop traces. Um, but in addition to giving them some experience in making geologic maps and being able to fly around and see what it is they're, um, they're mapping, um, they can also start to think about, if they haven't had structural geology, what it is about the erosion of these contacts that makes the, um, these wonderful patterns that we can see. It's also very useful for many students to be able to fly through a terrain like this and get a firsthand experience of what the difference is between the dip of bedrock layers and the slope of the topography. And that sounds like something that's not particularly confusing, but it is to at least to a number of my students. 
And in this true dip view, we're looking parallel to the strike, they could e actually even take a protractor and measure the dip angle here, which is a bit, uh, bit more than 10 degrees. It's also a useful way to, to have them look at um, a parent dip. So that was a true dip view. Here, of course, we're looking perpendicular to the strike parallel to the dip with an apparent dip of zero degrees. Um, in addition, in, uh, in Google Earth, you can have students draw uh, cross-section lines. And in, um, in the desktop version of Google Earth, if you right click on that line um, in, the, in the table of contents, you can actually show an elevation profile. So this, um, this elevation profile starts in the Northwest and goes to the Southeast and students can trace along and see what the elevation is at various points there. And if we um, go fly to a view that shows uh, the cross section running from left to right. Of course, you can see that there's a tremendous amount of vertical exaggeration in the, uh, in the profile here, but um, you can actually squash the profile and use the horizontal and the vertical scale to come pretty close to a profile without any vertical exaggeration in it at all, um, which then helps students understand not only vertical exaggeration, but gives them a basis for drawing their cross section. They can sit here, look at the cross section line, and uh, and um, draw their cross sections on the um, on the profile. Uh, so the only other thing I'm going to show you is that um, there are, are are good ways of using the profile tool to. Oops, hang on a second. I got to move this out of the way. Um, use the profile tool to help students understand that fundamentally for a given area these cross sections should all pretty much look the same. Um, here we have uh, a cross section that is um, has very much less topography on it, has a lot of surficial deposits in it. We can squash the profile down to what it actually looks like in the real world and then have them draw a cross section on that cross-section line as well that should really look very much like the one that they have drawn before, except for the fact that the intersections of the outcrop traces are going to be in different places uh, along the second cross-section. So I'm going to go back to um, the slides. Uh, I think I have to stop sharing my screen here. Yeah, Barb, I, I can load, yeah. load mine back okay. up. Could you load the, load the slides? Yeah. Um, there you go. And this will be in the slide set that we're going to post afterwards. But uh, last spring, I gave a, a talk at a uh, poster at, at EGU. And there are, are many more examples of kinds of things that you can do with students, as well as a place to download um, a whole series of place marks where you can try things out like this with your students. Okay, I'm going to pass it back over to John, I believe. Okay, John, I'm going to stop uh, here. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Okay. All right. So are you. For me. All right, thank you. While John's loading this, there have been some great comments in the chat, chat window. So we're trying to sort of trade off monitoring those as some one of the others of us is speaking, so. Okay, which, thanks Steve, is a, is a good lead in because uh, a lot of those uh, things in the chat have been questions about can he do this and can he do that? And uh, I've been answering most of them with no and especially not in the web version. Um, so you may at this point be wondering, well, what is the point of the web version? Uh, so that's what we're going to get into now, is to talk about web earth and talk about what advantages it does give us. Um, so the web version uh, is, first of all, very easy to access. You don't need to have anything special installed. If Chrome works on your computer, or one of the other supported browsers works, you just go to earth.goo.gov.com 
slash web will take you straight in. So feel free at this point to kind of follow along and do this yourself once I get into the, the demo of this. Um, now, in terms of the features in the web version, these are definitely a lot simpler than you're used to in good and bad ways. Good in terms of the menus have all been cleaned up. It's, it's a lot easier to find stuff. There isn't like menus within menus. Um, one of the reasons it's simpler is there just isn't as much there. So there's none of those elevation profile tools that were talked about. Um, there, there's a number of other features that are in the desktop that you won't find there. However, where the web version has upped its game considerably is when it, uh, we talk about content. And there's a lot of content in there in different forms. And we're, we're gonna look at um, this in a number of ways. We're gonna, for example, look at map layers. What I mean by map layers? Well, that's the, the GIS content, the, um, the roads, the borders, the place names, that sort of thing. Um, there's also a feature in there called Voyager, which is Google provided curated content that comes in different forms. And then there's a feature called uh, projects. And this is where that KML stuff comes in but it's a little bit confusing because there's KML and then there's stuff that looks the same as KML, but is not actually KML, although you can export it as KML, but it's not saved as KML. So that is, sounds confusing because it kind of is right now, and I'm hopefully going to unscramble that a little bit for you in the demonstration part. Right, so, um, Oh, and I, I just wanted to point out on the, in terms of the features that aren't there, um, there is no historical imagery, unfortunately, in the web-based version, um, which is a bit of a shame because, um, for example, Barb's work, um, which goes to some great geological locations around the world, um, some of them work better at different locations because she was able to scroll through a whole archive of data and find imagery that showed those features better. Um, that we can't do on the web version. But it's still valid, the, the landscape is there. And, and this is really where I like to start to talk about um, Google Earth in general, but particularly the web version, is you really need to think of it as a canvas. Uh, you know, the whole point of this seminar series is you can't get out in the field. And as has been pointed out, there's no substitute for that. But what we do have here is this incredible 3D model of the entire planet, which in some ways offers opportunities that you can't do in the field. I, when you go in the field, you're stuck within a certain fairly small area of the planet. With virtual field trips, the whole world is available to you. So it's really good to start thinking that way, thinking that. Google Earth is the canvas and the interface to access all of this great content and other things. Uh, but to do that, you need to know how to manipulate the application. So let's just start with a quick kind of navigation tutorial. So there's lots of ways to navigate in Earth. You can use the keyboard, you can use the mouse, you can use on-screen displays here. Um, I tend to use a combination of uh, keyboard and trackpad. Um, I'm using a, a MacBook right now. Um, so some of the controls might be slightly different depending on the device you're on. Um, but obviously the simple way to just look around the earth is click and grab right now with a mouse or a trackpad. Or you can use arrow keys to just pan up, down, all around. If we want to get in closer, to the planet, then there's different ways to zoom. You can actually use on-screen displays down here. They go kind of slowly, uh, I don't like them. So I actually use on my trackpad, I use two fingers, which is very smooth and easy to do. Uh, you can also click, and when you click, it goes a little bit of a distance in. Um, this is kind of nice if you need to fine tune how you're flying in. But then of course, what we wanna do is take care of the, uh, or, or make use of the fact that it's 3D. 
So the bit that people often struggle with in Google Earth is how to tilt. For example, the on-screen display way to tilt here is you actually need to double click that compass icon and make it the feature down in this bottom right hand corner. I'm hoping you can see this all down here. And then you actually kind of need to click and drag on it. Um, you can also use this wheel around the outside to rotate. It's awkward. Um, so the best kind of trick I can ever show you with Google Earth is this. Hold the shift key and use arrows up and down. That is the best way to tilt. In fact, shift and side to side will rotate as well. Now, if you're doing all that and you get a little bit lost and you want to reset your view, uh, there's a quick way to do that. You can hit the U key, U for up. And likewise, if you need to know where North is again, you can hit the N key, N for North. Or if you're feeling particularly lazy, hit the R key, R for reset, and you will do both of those things. So U, N, and R. Um, the other thing maybe to point out is if you have a mouse with a uh, wheel or actually just with a trackpad, if you hold, uh, at least on a MacBook, I think if you hold the Apple key or the shift, you can get a full kind of six degrees of freedom. So it's very easy to quickly pan around like this. Um, Really just the, the best way to navigate is just play with the keys, learn to do it because the, the better you are at navigating, the more comfortable you're going to be using this as a teaching tool. Um, you know, we, we, we hate looking stupid as teachers that we don't know where to find stuff or we don't know how to do it and that can scare us off. But if you spend like, you know, 15, 20 minutes playing with this, just getting used to flying around, um, you'll get comfortable and you'll have a lot more confidence of using it. In terms of other kind of features in here, one I want to point out in the sidebar here is the last icon right here, the little ruler, um, which is the measuring tool. So the way this works is it brings up a, a box and then we have a crosshair where we click to start and then we can just drag it out, click, and we can build up a multi-segmented line. Um, or if we close the shape, we're also going to get area and perimeter. Now, what I really like about this, if we go over here where you're seeing those numbers, um, which by the way, can be changed in terms of the, uh, the units you're using. So you've got, you know, centimeters, meters, kilometers for the uh, civilized world and inches and feet, inches and feet, just especially for the US because we have to be different. So, um, and also smooths if you prefer to use smooths because we all know what a smooth is, right? So, well, if, if you if don't put it in MIT the chat, so then I'll explain it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but no, what I was gonna mention was over here that these little, uh, copy the icons when, when you copied it it's actually going to copy that number to the clipboard so this is really great for students you could set an assignment where you they have to measure certain things and they can go there and they can easily kind of grab the answer and paste it into a document or a spreadsheet uh, now just one thing i want to show at this point is i want to open up that sidebar um, so by the way, on a, on a Google a, a product, if you ever see three lines like this, it means that there's a sidebar that opens up. If you ever see three dots, it means there's a drop down menu that opens up. You'll see that more on our mobile applications. But we have a sidebar here, and one of the things under the sidebar is this thing settings. And under settings, you can do things like, for example, change the default units of measurement. Uh, also, some other things that we're gonna we're gonna get to in just a moment. I'll mention maybe one thing here, which is under general settings as a region, um, and the region is set. You can't change that. The computer figures out where you are. 
Now, the reason that's actually kind of cool and, and is new compared to desktop is one of the problems we had with the desktop version was it, Google were never allowed to launch it in certain countries because it included borders and the borders were a fixed thing. The trouble is borders and place names are only fixed from one country's perspective. For example, not everyone calls the Persian Gulf the Persian Gulf. Not everyone agrees where the boundary between Pakistan and India and neighboring countries are. With the regional thing, they're able to change it based on the location of where you're using Google Earth, um, which has hence made it sort of more allowable in a lot more places around the world. Uh, let's cancel out there. Um, and then the final thing I want to talk about in terms of features is the fact that we are on a web page. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, you know, let's say I want to share this view of the Himalayas with my students. In the old world of the desktop, the way I would do that is I would have to create a place mark and I would have to snapshot the view to that place mark. Then I would have to save that place mark out and then somehow share it with my students who upload it, who open it, click on it, flies to that viewpoint. All very cumbersome. Because this is a web-based version, the way I can share is I can go up here and copy the URL and then Zoom features getting in the way. Sorry. I can just go up here, uh, paste, and it's going to go and open Google Earth, another version of Google Earth, at that exact same location. So it will, running too many things right now. Come on, here we go. There we go. So different tab, same view. Um, so this is really neat because you can, you, you can save any position, like any little change, any little tiny change is a unique URL. In fact, if you watched URL as I move around, Hopefully, yeah, you'll see that the numbers change um, because the URL is effectively made up of the coordinates and its height and the orientation and all those things. <clears throat> all right, so that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of features. Um, the, now I want to really focus on with the uh, sort of our remainder time here is content. Um, so I'm going to start out by going here to this symbol, sorry, not this symbol, this symbol, map style, and just point out the different options there. Um, I like to keep a clean globe. Some people like to have all the borders and labels turned on, and this is where you do that. And as I zoom in, you'll see that these things now appear. Um, what is useful is there's a customizable option. Um, so, you know, one of the things I, when, when I'm introducing Google Earth to people, uh, to students especially, I, I try and say to them, well, what do you notice about this model of the world? What's, what's wrong with it? And after a while, they eventually figure out, well, there's no clouds. Um, it's also summer everywhere. But the big one is there's no clouds. So they went to a lot of um, trouble, and I don't have time to get into it, to process out the clouds from the imagery. Um, but then what they did is they went and put the clouds back in, um, which, you know, great. But actually what they did is they put real clouds in, as in these are really, uh, these are real time updated, well, almost real time updated clouds. And in fact, if you go down here, you can get down to an option to turn on animated clouds for the last 24 hours. Um, you know, getting a little off the kind of like the field geology here, but if you're talking about kind of climate stuff um, and bringing that into story, it's a really useful feature to have. Um, another feature that's useful is grid lines. Um, 
turning those on, you know, explaining the idea that the prime meridian is a made up line. It's there because a bunch of old guys with big beards who didn't like the French decided it needed to go through London. That's a simplified story, but basically what happened. Um, as opposed to the Arctic Circle, which is still an imaginary line, but it exists because of a real world physical thing to do with the tilt of the earth and the seasons. And I know I don't need to explain this to all of you. Um, but it's a really fun way to kind of get these concepts into students and asking questions like, for example, what is the easternmost state in the US, um, which we all know is Alaska. Think about it. Where's the antimeridium? Where are the Aleutians? Right, so those are the map stars. So you can play around with those. Um, I mentioned that there's this thing called Voyager. This is the third icon here. And Voyager is the built-in content. And I don't have a lot of time to really get into this. There's a lot of tours and kind of story content in here. Some things that might be of more interest to you guys are things under layers, um, where, for example, we have layers such as the volcanoes, showing the locations of all the volcanoes that erupted during the Holocene period, or um, tsunami, some of the, the big tsunamis that have occurred during history. I, I was heavily involved in creating both of these things. Um, so that's why I like to point them out. But, um, but no, as a as a geoscientist, they're, they're very useful tools. There's also within Voyager, um, you can go and find a lot of the good street view stuff. Now, what they don't have in Voyager is actually a decent search mechanism. And I haven't mentioned search yet, but there is a search bar here. And we can, for example, search for, let's say, Yosemite National Park. And it will bring up options for that. And if we click on that, it will fly to it. No, oh, sorry, I'm gonna turn the grid lines off. So we'll fly to Yosemite. Um, but if I just do that search again, you'll notice that there's some other options came up under this title Voyager Stories. So any of those Voyager Stories that have uh, content related to what you're searching can also be linked to and by the way have unique URLs that can be shared if you share that URL right the URL right now students will go directly to that content but that's all very well you know there might be some good stuff in there but really you want to be able to create your own content you want to make the KML type stuff so how do we do that well, the way we do that is using this thing here called projects. So if we are projects, this is where it can get a little confusing with the KML story. Because if you look down here, there's sort of multiple options and things you can do. Um, we can open a project, we can import a KML from Drive, we can import a KML from the computer, or we can create a new KML or a new project. So I'm going to start by creating a new project, which is going to look very much like creating KML, or at least what KML you can do in the web version, which is basically points, lines, and polygons. So place marks or points, lines, shapes, or polygons. Um, and there's also a new feature called a full screen slide, which is what it says on the tin. It's just adding an image that goes full screen. Um, so we can, for example, search for a place. So I'm going to go to a place that I know very well. Um, I mentioned my background it is actually uh, geoscience. So I, I went to school in Hawaii. My, my master's PhD is geology, geophysics, specifically volcanology. So the Big Island is a place I spent a lot of time uh, field work and teaching, in fact, in the field. So we can go here and if we want, we can actually just add this directly. Um, there's some buggy things with that right now. So to be honest, I kind of prefer in my project 
to add my own place mark right here. And I haven't named my project, but that's okay. Let's name this Volcanoes National Park. I'll actually give it its correct name, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And I can't spell. And uh, we're gonna go into the place mark here. And just to show you briefly, I don't wanna spend a lot of time doing this because Really, if you've done any sort of place mark making the desktop version, this will be very familiar. But I do want to point out a couple of things. For example, the fact that you can choose from a wide range of icons. And there's even a volcano icon we can bring up. Or you can upload your own custom image. Very important if we're making kind of field maps. Uh, we can change the size here, we can change the color. And also the other thing we can do is we can set that default view. So let's say we want to fly in by default to kind of a nice overview of Kilauea here. We can capture that view right there. And so when we go to present mode, that's the view that that feature is going to go to. Now we can also go in here and as I say, we can add lines and polygons. We can add these full screen slides. What we can't do is do any of the 3D modeling. Um, but really where this is at is it's, it's not so much a mapping tool anymore. The idea is it's more of a presentation storytelling tool because one of the real strengths here is this ability to add info boxes. So we can, for example, add what's called a large info box. And if we just type random stuff in here and go and preview that. Right here, what we get is this sidebar that opens up. And in fact, we could have included in that sidebar um, Sorry, my spelling today is atrocious, but uh, we can add in images and things, which in a second, there we go. So that will show up in the sidebar. And in fact, that sidebar is very powerful because you don't have to stick to their happy little gooey thing. You can, and, and there's a lot you can do in there. You know, you can hyperlink stuff, so this, um, you, you can hyperlink, in fact, to different parts of your presentation. If you have, you know, more than one feature, you can link directly to other features. Uh, you can also link out to external URLs. Um, so really, this is what turns it into being this sort of canvas, which can be an interface to all the different data sets and, um, and tools. Or if you know what you're doing with HTML, there's a whole kind of HTML ingest thing here where you can pull in whatever JavaScript, CSS, HTML5. You can do all sorts of crazy things in here. You can do iframes. You can, for example, embed Google Maps in Google Earth. I'm not entirely sure why you do that, but you can do that. Um, you can also embed 360 images in the side bay. You can see 360 videos, YouTube videos. Um, the view, by the way, that you capture could also be set to uh, street view. So if we turn on the little Pigman character there and decide that we want to capture street view, and we landed somewhere in the middle of the bush, but you could capture that view. And when you go into the presentation, that will be the default view. Hey, John, we're kind of running out of time here. Yeah. So. I was just going to wrap up um, with two more things. The one, the fact that you've made this in the cloud um, means that it is shareable. 
as in I can share this just like a Google Doc. I can give other people editing rights. I can give them viewing rights. I could share it with a few people. I could share it with the world. That is the advantage of making that project, making a project. Um, I can also close it out and it's already saved by default to my Google Drive so I can open it again later. Now this is in contrast to if I create or import a KML file. That KML file, the old style of making content, um, once you import that, it's just local to your computer. You can in fact import it from Google Drive, but you can only save it on your computer and you can't share it with the world, unfortunately. Hopefully at some point that will be possible, um, but we're not there yet. So, Since we're running out of time, I'm not going to talk about mobile or show mobile, except to say it basically runs the same as the web. The only difference is there's no project creation to go on, but you can view it. I put in the uh, slide deck here, which we're going to share with you, some really useful links. The only um, thing just to mention at the bottom there, if you really want to get into this, like doing crazy stuff in, in the web-based Google Earth, probably the best most innovative person out there in terms of EDU content. There's a friend of mine called Josh Williams, who's a geography professor in Austin, who's kind of a mad code genius in his spare time. And he runs a great website with lots of great examples. So I'm gonna turn this back to Steve now for the last couple of minutes, just to, uh, just to finish up with one last example. So I'm going to suggest if people need to leave to just go ahead and do that. But I think for our purposes, Steve, it's worth just going through this. So just take your time and go through this and we can have some questions afterwards. Okay. Um, thanks everyone. I, uh, the last thing that I wanted to share is, so I'm in the web version of Google earth here and one thing that I've been intrigued with is now that the web version is more available to people and it doesn't require students to download a program or that sort of stuff. Um, you know, what can we do from a mapping perspective? And so what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to open up a KML file. Um, it's on my computer, but uh, the KML file is uh, this field area that we typically take students to in Ireland called Lockfee. And what we did is we developed a, um, a basically a script that what it does is it takes CSV files of typical field data and it will then generate strike and dip symbols. Um, so this is the field area in Western Ireland and these strike and dip symbols have uh, data on them. Um, if you click on them, it'll bring up your, let's see here, here we go. It'll bring up your, your, your basic data that might have been in your field book. If you rotate your view, these are oriented in space uh, correctly. There are symbols for bedding, there are symbols for foliation, as you see up in some other areas. Um, if you happen to not have bedding data, it just comes in as a dot. So the idea here is, you know, if we can do this, if we can import data, um, so I'm going to switch back to the upright view here. If we can import data from a field area, then here are some uh, contacts and some faults that have been brought in from the field. Then we can allow our students to say, okay, they can go over here on the left um, choose a new feature, right? Um, we can draw a line or a shape and they can say, all right, well, so now from here, you know, maybe over to here, down to here, over to here, I did a bad job, but you get the idea, all right? So we create a polygon. We're gonna call this polygon, the lock mask formation. Um, we can then say, you know, what do we want the outline of that to be? We can clean it up a little bit fill color 25%, we can make it red because that's the color of the units. We can type in a little text, right? And so now you've got your students that are starting to basically take your field data and start to build a geologic map out of it. 
Um, and again, as John said, the way this works is you can just draw lines. If you don't close the lines, they become lines. They could be contacts. If you close it, they become polygons and they can be areas. So um, the idea here, I think, is fairly powerful. Um, and uh, it's a way to start bringing in field, area, field data and then allowing students to explore the field area and start building their map out of that. Um, and they can then, as John has said, if you go up here, once they've done this, then they can export it as a KML file and it becomes their project that potentially that they can turn in. Um, I've just drawn this arbitrary outline to sort of illustrate maybe the field area that you might want students to work in and to complete. Now, we have a beta version of the tool that allows you to do this. And so I'm gonna briefly show this to you. Um, you all are welcome to uh, exp uh, experiment with this, but this is the symbols beta that's on uh, the, the Whitmire Geode site page. If you go there, you get to, again, this is beta, it's sort of bare bones right now, but you can choose a CSV file. So I'm gonna choose this one, which again is the one that I just showed you all, um, if I can find it. There it is, LOXV all CSV. And what that'll do is that'll bring in, um, if you're all curious as to what this thing looks like, it's just a standard CSV file um, that you've exported out of Excel or something else. So that's kind of what it would just look like, the raw file. And then once you're in this uh, tool, you basically can say, okay, name is just the name of the, of the point, uh, type is the symbol type, and you can change these to what they are. So you'll notice the symbols were, were colored by, full, by, uh, by unit, so that's setting its symbol color. You set strike um, or trend if it's a, a lineation, dip or plunge if it's a foliation, um, you can do dip direction as well. Um, you can set the unit. And I'm just assigning these columns to what sort of data is in there. There's a, a notes observations. And then of course, Latin long. And it still flags this one here, which is just my header. So I'm just gonna get rid of the headers one. You can also get rid of unwanted columns if you don't wanna use those. Then, uh, you can play around with how big you want the symbol to be on your map, how thick you want the line to be, and then this is your download file, and then you just export it. And that'll give you a KML file. And if I go back to, uh, where am I? Google Earth, I'm gonna clear this one and just upload the one that we created. And there it is. So um, there are a lot of features that aren't in the, that, the web tool for uploading data, but if this is something you think might be useful to you in terms of, of building a map, by all means, it's, it's available. And uh, this is largely the work of Miladin Georgievich and me, and we keep iterating back and forth and improving things and so on and so forth. So. That's just an example of maybe how you might want to use Web Google Earth to help um, do a student exercise um, on mapping in the field. Anyway, so I'm going to go back to uh, our original page and move to the last slide. The slides that we used are available uh, here at that bit.ly location the resource, the KML files, Barb's uh, KMZ file um, are available at the lower bit.ly there. And I'm gonna stop there. And if folks want to uh, get any questions in there, I know we ran a little late. So um, thanks everybody for hanging out, those of you that are still around.
No, most people did. Thank you all very much. That was really well done. I think it covered a lot of what people wanted to see. So that's very helpful. Um, someone just asked, can the symbol file be imported to a GE desktop? Yeah, it works that it works in both places. So it doesn't use models. That was the big change. We had an old version that used models and that can't be used in the web version. This one actually just constructs lines. Um, and so it works, it's platform independent. Great. Um, there was a conversation going on with Kevin and Ben. Ben, if you're still around, can you summarize uh, Vanderplein, what you were talking about with the uh, different projects versus symbols, things I, I do, wasn't quite following. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I found it incredibly interesting. Like I, all of us, we suddenly are looking at virtual trips because we're not allowed to go outside. So I thought, I decided I'll do a quickie and I do my, my structure field trip, which failed because I was not allowed to go. And I did all this uploading in desktop and I realized that the students do not want to load desktop at Google Earth for a number of reasons. So I went to the web version and then I discovered, I learned by making mistakes. I'm not a smart guy. I don't read first. I first try and then I fail and I try again. Then I uploaded everything I did into Google Earth web. That worked great for me and it turned out, as John already correctly said and, and alerted us, you should build your project in Google Earth Web from scratch. Because what I discovered is that I could do a perfect upload from the KML file, but I loaded about 30 or so photos for outcrop sites in addition to geologic maps for those outcrop sites. And very quickly, the uh, Google Earth Web KML upload would not take any more files. It turns out there's a limit apparently somewhere the bottom line was I simply took those KML points, which were only 12 points, and I, I redid them as a, um, um, so I started the project again with one screen open where the original points were and a fresh screen, which has nothing. And I rebuilt the web project now in Google Earth Web. And then I just copied the locations and stuff. I changed the views. And I could, at my leisure, include photos, pictures, and even screenshots of the geologic maps for those particular views that were on top of that. And it really, and the bottom line was, other than, of course, that I failed a couple of times, it took me about two hours to take my entire field trip with some photos I took over the years to make that a virtual field trip. And so it's a worthwhile activity, but start in Google Earth Web uh, and, and don't import. So I imported Barbara's KML, for example, and that's great for me, but only I can see this. My students have to load the same KML file, but don't see any pictures I add to that. And so it's, it's, I'm wasting time on my own end. I can see my own pictures already. And so you have to rebuild it from scratch. But there's one feature while I have the attention, which I really was trying, which was a little frustrating. John, maybe you can help. I am trying to give students a narrated field trip. And Google Earth Web does not allow you to overlay a voice uh, a layer or and even a video layer takes the entire screen, which is not useful. Um, and I was hoping for that one little addition that allows me to say, click here and hear Ben talk, which I love to hear, but nobody else does. But at least uh, it's one way to do it. And yeah. I was looking for that, John. Yeah, so um, I'll answer that in just a second. But just back to your point not to get in the technical weeds. Um, I'm glad that you had that problem with your KML and you've highlighted it for people because it, it's basically, it's the, it's the technicalities of trying to save stuff within KML versus the new behind the scenes pseudo KML project codes that is a lot more efficient in terms of compressing and storing images. Um, so that's number one. Uh, there was another point. The sound. I don't know what it was, but I'll get back to it. But in terms of the audio, um, you can do it. You know how you described that you can do HTML stuff in the sidebar? HTML5 audio tags. Um, it's, that's how you do it. If you want to see examples of that, go to that blog, um, Josh Williams stuff. Josh has examples up there where he has synced he, in fact, Josh does crazy stuff. He has it automatically playing tours. Like it will change between features. Like he goes above and beyond. But in terms of just adding in the audio, it's actually really, really easy. It's about three lines of HTML that you just paste straight into the interface. 
can you send me a quick link where I go to? Yeah, that sounds I, fantastic because that's, yeah. and I tell the people who are instructors, one of the things I learned when I talk with the students, they actually like us to give a bit of a perspective as they are flying around on those pages. Even though we like to think they can do it all on their own, maybe the students I have are not at enterprising, but they really don't do anything until you to, to do something. And that's why the voiceover is a motivational and engagement kind of characteristic. So I, that's why I was looking for that. It's yeah, no, no, um, feel free to just um, get my email off someone and, and message me. And uh, it's, it's two in the morning here, but I'll, uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll dig out the code and send it to you. So. And also, if you get that working, we might want to uh, have you as an example of just how to do that, because I suspect other people would likely do that. So if you're willing. Be careful, Basil. Never take me as an example. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anyone else? Barb, you had some comments about the Zogros. Do you want to just say those um, out loud about? Yeah, sure. Um, someone asked about whether it's possible to use the elevation data set in Google Earth to construct structure contours or strike lines based on elevations along outcrop traces. And the elevation footprint, um, uh, the data set footprint is, isn't adequate in a lot of areas, but there are a couple places where this actually does work really well. And um, uh, on, the, on the poster and the KMZ files that go with it that I had at EGU, I have an example of, of how I use this in the Zagros, where you can actually, uh, where the students can do this themselves, they can just pick points of equal elevation along a contact in one of these flat iron areas and, and plot a couple of more structure contours and then plot them at absolute elevation so they don't go up and over the top of the flat iron. They actually vanish right into the, the rock and come out the other side along the contact, which is um, actually really instructive for students because all of a sudden some of them go, oh my god, I understand what a structure contour is now. Um, but then it's possible to, to um, measure the map distance and calculate the dip. And that dip is very close to what they measure with a protractor if they're looking straight down the line of flat irons. So um, if you want to have that example where it works well, it's on the poster. Great. Thank you very much, Barb. Um, I know we're over time, but I suspect um, people will, this group would still take questions if people have them. Yeah, there was actually two in the chat. There was some, I, I remembered what, uh, it was something uh, Kevin, I think, mentioned. Um, he was asking about, he wanted to build a project and make parts of it iteratively available to his students over time. Um, you can't do that per se. Um, there is a way of making features visible or invisible, and then when it's presented, only certain things will show up. Um, if you're sharing access to them, uh, they should, I believe they can still go back in and turn those things on uh, off by default. The other way to approach this potentially is just to build multiple kind of versions and that you sort of like just either at the end of one version there's a url that links to the next version or you just send them the updated version over time um not ideal solutions but but ways to work around that um and the other thing i wanted to say was you know there was a couple of questions about the desktop version and why people don't want to use it um others can probably speak to this but you know the bottom line is it was always and still is very resource intensive. It, it requires a whole bunch of bandwidth. It has a tendency to close when Google Earth Desktop wants to close, not when you want it to close. And if it does that and you're working on stuff, you can lose it. Um, and students, they, they, they just don't think about downloading a big clunky application like that. It's, it's, if they can't access in two seconds via web browser, preferably on a mobile device, they're really not interested. So, you know, that's just my thoughts. Could I, could I offer a comment on that? Um, I've used desktop for ever with my students. And when they're there in the classroom and I simply as homework require them to download it, I have never had anyone complain about using it actually. And um, yesterday 
when I was struggling with my bandwidth here, I actually was more successful with desktop than I was. I couldn't, I couldn't get the web version to run worth a darn. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm still not, not convinced that there aren't some, there isn't some value in the desktop version. Oh, there's definitely value, because, especially in terms of the features. But I mean, you know, in, in terms of the performance, it is more resource intensive. And the, the trouble is that gaps only going to kind of get worse because there's a minimal amount of effort being put into that application. Although there is effort, there is upkeep of it. So, you know, it, it will keep running as long as it needs to keep running. And certainly it will be there through this kind of, you know, next six months, summer field season. So from the perspective of this group, it's, that's why we wanted to talk about the different options available. Mm -hmm. sure. All right, I think, um, thank you again. That was really helpful. I think it showed us a wide variety of things that are possible um, and we'll probably should cut it off at this point. Um, so we will see everybody maybe next Thursday if they want to hear about open topography and other things and we'll have that figured out and I'll send a message out for that. We also have a meeting at Monday at the standard 11 a.m. Eastern time to talk about some teaching activities. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.